I've had a really good time with it. Yeah. But then it gets to this point where it's like, well, try this one, try this. I'm like, and this one's dry. And this one, I'm like, no. Yeah, like, oh, no, smell, no. Yeah. And now mark this one. I'm like, oh. The first 12 were okay. I think we're, we're done here. And I'm like, good. Who's driving me? You know, like, who's <laughs> driving me home? This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. The contributions of African-Americans in the distilling industry has largely gone unnoticed and unrecognized for a long period of time. The story of Uncle Nearest was really the first one that put mainstream media attention and a spotlight on the issue. But there's one person who spends her time on capturing stories and diving into distillery archives to discover more African-American influence on whiskey. Erin Williams Gilliam is an associate professor of history at Kentucky State University, and she sits down with me to talk about some of her findings. She gives an amazing amount of insight into record keeping that documented how slaves that knew how to distill were actually quite valuable. Erin also spends her time interviewing older generations of people who worked at distilleries, not only in Kentucky, but also nearby states, to document the culture and the roles of African Americans held at distilleries through recent periods of time. And she's always on the hunt for the next great story. So if you have a family, connection, or a relative, reach out to Erin so she can continue her quest. With that, I hope you enjoy today's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Anonymous, this person requested to be anonymous, who hits me up on fredminnick.com. Now, this came in prior to the holiday, so I'll keep that in mind, but this is still an important issue here. I'm writing you with an idea for Above the Char. What is your advice for the situation when you have family members that go out of their way to buy a unicorn bottle for the holidays? The trouble is, what if it's a fake? Is it fair to tell them to watch for scams? What should they watch for? Any advice you have would be appreciated. I told them I'd love some Wild Turkey 101 or some Old Granddad Bonded or 114, but I can tell they want to find Pappy or Weller or something harder to find. Love your show and all your content. So Anonymous, that is a great, great question, especially coming from the state you're in. I won't even name the state you're in, but he comes from a really high-level control state. This is a big big, big issue. And you see it all the time. And, you know, gifts and newbies is how the scammers and bourbon keep on living. And basically the best advice I can give you, if it is not connected to Drizzly, which is directly connected to actual shops, or it's not connected to a physical retail store, then they do not buy it. You cannot, if somebody is new and they're shopping for bourbon, you cannot trust the websites. You know, you can send them to some place like Sealbox, but you're looking at a really major issue and the scammers know it and it's not a big enough issue to draw in the FTC, but it's a major issue in our community and you got people wanting to get a special gift and boom, right there, Blanton's for 39 bucks, Pappy Van Winkle for 150. Yeah, right. So I'd say like, You know, if they want to hunt, then the hunt has to be in a physical store. That's it. That's the best way to prevent a scam ending up in a present. So that's for the newbies as well. Do not trust people trying to sell you bourbon on Instagram. Do not trust websites that seem too good to be true because they are too good to be true. I feel like I've given dissertations at this point on the amount of bourbon scam conversations I've had, both on YouTube, here on Bourbon Pursuit. I've written about it. I mean, but people will always want what they can't get. And they're always going to fall for the scams because everybody has that FOMO feeling and they have that good special place in the heart that they want to give. But there's always going to be a wolf out there and you're always going to be the sheep if you don't protect yourself on how to shop for rare bottles. And that's basically the best advice I got for you, Anonymous. It's the best advice I got for you. Send them to a physical store if they're a gift buyer. That's all I got. But that's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. If you have an idea for Above the Char, be like Anonymous and hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. 
hit the contact button, send your question. If I like it, I'll read it on the air. Until next week, cheers. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits, and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina, drink responsibly, and be 21. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 a cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny here today riding solo, but talking about a subject that we have never really done on the show before, but we've got a guest that has been really diving into the subject of Black and African American history and bourbon. And I think it's really kind of cool because we get to see exactly what are the contributions that have been made over time. I know Fred Minnick has come out with articles before talking about everything that has maybe been swept underneath the rug or not really been exposed But today, we're going to be able to talk to somebody that is really going to be able to show us what that is and really enlighten us on the research about everything that she's been doing for quite some time, too. So today on the show, we have Erin Wiggins-Gilliam, or otherwise known as Dr. G. She is a PhD and associate professor of African-American studies at Kentucky State University. So Erin, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm I'm excited. I'm happy to be here. So yeah. I appreciate it. Well, I mean, I always love to be able to find an avenue where you can share everything that you've done as, as somebody that's in higher education, because you do a lot of research and, and being able to find avenues of being able to promote it and, and show that really what you're doing is is really affecting a lot of people too. I hope so. That's but before we get to there, I was trolling your your Twitter before <laughs> and you had oh, a, a pretty fun one out there. And it said that I lose AirPods like normal people lose a bottle of water. This is crazy. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> what happens? I don't know. Like I literally just, Seth and, all right, and I don't lose the whole case. I lose one. Just one. So yeah, you can't buy just one. And it's and I've got these, you know, the whole academic liberal hippie. I've got all these piercings, so I only usually wear the right one, and so I always lose the right one. It's, and then I'll go. So I'm like, okay, I'll just break down and go buy a new set. <laughs> so and then I find them, and so I literally have 
six little cases with the, only the left AirPod in it. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And six of them, though? Yeah, it's bad. Well, I, I was about to say, I was like, I don't even know if you can go on eBay and just sell me like, sorry, we're only, it's only left ear pods we have for sale on this channel. <laughs> All I have. <laughs> and, I've, and I broke down and before I have not and bought like, okay, let me just try some generic. And it doesn't give me the same with my phone. As soon as you get in the Apple ecosystem, you can't break out. You can't. It's, it, on, it's on your phone. It's on your laptop. It's, even it's on, on your kids, watch. So I can see my, what my kids are doing and who they're talking to and where they are just because I need to be able to the whole Apple family. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I love it. And, and depending on how old are your kids? Oh, shoot, look, <laughs> nine and four. Yeah. And so the nine-year-olds get to the point where you've got to be a little little cautious about what they're, what they're finding. My too. She's pretty tech savvy. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I'll fix the Apple TV for you. Here I come. <laughs> get out of the way, geezer. Right. She's like, oh, my God, this is all you have to do. And I'm like. I mean, I, I remember when my kid was three and I think it was, maybe he was in two. It's like, it's just that it's like a young age when they give him, you give him the iPad and you just see them start swiping Swipe, yeah. without like, even, without even teaching. Like they mm-hmm. just learn and it becomes so ingrained. And now it's like, I need my iPad mm-hmm. time. I need my iPad, iPad time. time. And my nine year old's really good because she's been virtual school virtually. And so now she's like. <laughs> and she can do it on the Chromebook. She brings up the MacBook. Then she brings in the, her, iP- her iPad and her phone. I'm like, okay, well, can you help mommy troubleshoot this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, we're all going to need some of that help later on for we these are. kids that are digitally native and stuff like that, too. So I kind of want to talk a little bit before we get into your studies and everything like okay, that. Cool. A little bit about you and, and your history because... First, what got you into doing bourbon. academia? Okay. And maybe, well, we'll talk oh, about bourbon. Okay. I kind of want to talk about what got you into academia as well. I mean, like uh, your childhood growing up and what kind of led right, you down cool. this path as well. So I've always been interested in history. I'm like the nerdy kid that when families went on like vacations, you made the little stops, I wanted to go. I wasn't a great student though, but I've always loved like history vacations. I always loved to read. And so that was kind of what the thing was. And I got into college. And I went to Kentucky State for undergrad. I was like, what am I going to do? Like, And I'm like, well, I would love to teach history. So I did social studies education. And I taught in Franklin County and Jasmine County in Kentucky for a couple of years. And then I got a chance, the only reason why I went, to get a PhD for free. That's one way to do it. <laughs> and when somebody's like, well, you know, you can get a PhD for free. I'm like, oh, okay. And you could teach on the college level. It's a little bit more flexible than high school. And that was why I went. And I just... Start. I moved to Lexington. My mom came, packed up my apartment, moved me to Lexington. And next thing I know, I was a PhD student at UK in 2010. And, and that was in 2010. So mm-hmm. then you you got your PhD in... Oh, I took the like the detour route. I got my yeah, PhD okay. in like 2017. I started teaching at Kentucky State as a instructor in 2014. And just started teaching like 100 level history classes. And I just always... I've always wanted, I've always loved teaching. So I've always been in it for the teaching. I like the research now, but I've always been a teacher. Is it just because you want to leave an impression on younger generations or is it because you also teach in, in higher education? Mm-hmm. So you want to, I guess, spark of course something. I want to spark, you, know, you, want, you want to find like, make the light bulb turn on with somebody's head, right? <laughs> I'm trying to think of some really cool teacher co op, but I can't even think of it. <laughs> like, some that are like, oh my God, teachers make the way. I don't know. I've literally just always loved the classroom. And so I have a friend who says the reason that I like it, and this is going to sound so like, oh my God. So corny. Yeah. Like that. The reason that I like it, because I like every, the attention to be on me. And so for 45 minutes, it's my show, you know what I mean? And I love, but I do, in all seriousness, I love my students. They're fun. They keep me young. And I, like, you know what I mean? But it's just, yeah, it's just something I've been in literally the classroom since I was 21, 22. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is, and not to take it and try to put the spotlight on me, but of I mean, any means, but I do some public speaking as well for my own job. And I remember the first time that I ever had to do any public speaking, it was in a room with 500 people. And I got this rush. You get this rush of like, wow, this is, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to say you feel this power, but you do, you feel this. You you, you feel this. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really, really kind of cool feeling. 
knowing that you can kind of control the room mm. and people are listening to you. I do remember after that, I said, I got to go take a public speaking class because I'm sure I dropped so many ums, you knows, and I so's. And yeah, I mean, I think that's just one of the things you, you learn after doing it for so long. <laughs> I still do too. Or I have been in Kentucky for most of all of my adult life and most of my teenage years. So sometimes the Kentucky girl comes out at me and my students who are usually from Chicago, St. Louis, they'll say, what? Dropping some y'alls. Yeah, oh, I'm y'all all the time. Y'all, y'all got to get this together. I even tell my y'all need to clean this up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So before we started talking today, as well, I mean, you said like, oh, how'd you get into bourbon? You didn't actually get into bourbon first, did you? I didn't. I didn't. Talk about your spirits journey then. <laughs> so I love a good time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone you've ever met from my college days to now hitting forty, I love a good time. And so I've always been, if you, you, I'll try it or whatever. Bourbon was never really on my radar just because I've always been a tequila girl. You can look me up. I'm like the tequila girl that researches bourbon. But what really got me into the bourbon industry, I had a friend who was doing some work with Buffalo Trace and they said they needed an archivist or a historian to come in and look at their archives. And I was like, okay. Who, who was this person, by the way? Mike Adams. He okay. is the vice president of the Kentucky Black Bourbon Guild, or he was at that time. And so he calls me 2019, 18. And he's like, hey, come to Buffalo Trace. We're establishing a partnership. And I sat th there and for about from January till about August, I went through Buffalo Trace's archives and just tried to get as much as I can about African-American contribution to Buffalo Trace, women's contribution to the bourbon industry, and just really just goes with history. And just to see, hey, let me see through the uh, the history through the eyes of Buffalo Trace at that point and now through the eyes of bourbon. And And what year was that? I believe that was, he asked me in 2018, I think the very first time that I actually went on Buffalo Trace's campus was 2019. Okay. Yeah. Because I read somewhere that you really kind of started this journey back around 2019 mm -hmm. and, and just really went all in on it. I did. I did. I've kind of slowed down a little bit, just, you know, work, pandemic and all of that, you know, and I always have to tell people who like, hey, come out and do the, this for the bourbon thing, bourbon thing. I'm like, okay, this is like my part-time hustle. This is like my, and for fun. And there's so many bourbon things that happen around yeah, here. At no, it's like every, I, every weekend they're like, can you come? I'm like, can you come? I'm like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, I would love to come. And you, you reach out to me a couple months, I'll come. But just, you know, it's, it's my, it's my part-time gig. It's my, it's, it's not even a gig. It's my, um something for fun. Yeah. It's passion. And, you know, someone invites you somewhere and you get to try all these bourbons. And I've gone someplace and I've got different types of bourbon, cold salads. Like I have the best job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's an easy one. Just come and fill me up with some drinks. Right? Yeah. And some bourbon sampled food. Yeah. I'll try it. For sure. Yeah. So I, let's kind of roll back. So you, you started getting into this and started uncovering things. And there's a lot of things that we're all still, I mean, most people kind of heard about like Uncle Nearest and all these mm -hmm. other kind of things too, but kind of talk about, it was Buffalo Trace where you first got started and started really uncovering things or were there other pieces? So Buffalo Trace, I'll be honest, was the first distillery that allowed me to come into their archives. So, but of course, once I really didn't know, I'll be honest, I'm a historian. I really didn't know about Uncle Nearest. I didn't know about Jack Daniels. I didn't know that. And then when I began to work at Buffalo Trace, and then of course, then I'm like, well, let me just do a little Google search. And then I met it and I start reading all these other things. And I'm like, hold on, Kentucky's got to have their Uncle Nearest. And so that's where I'm at now. Like, I've got to find this story. I know that it's there. How it's documented, I don't know, but I'm trying to figure that out. Mm hmm. So when you're going through Buffalo Trace, I, I kind of want to talk about what you found and some of the significance of your of your findings as well of of the people and, mm -hmm. and everything like that. So kind of talk us through that. Um, Buffalo Trace definitely. We know the uh, for the Johnson family, Freddie Johnson. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so definitely their stories were in there. His grandfather's stories were in there, and just the role of Blanton and bringing in Freddie Johnson. And but you know, I also saw, like I said, that bourbon is truly a 
lens where you get to look at history. You get to see where African Americans first started off as like laborers. They weren't even allowed to like be in the actual bourbon house or in the bourbon, like to make the barrels and things like that. They were fixing the fences at Buffalo Trace, maintaining the yard, things like that. And then as you see history transition, as you see as society transitions, the next thing you know, oh, now they're in the they're in the they're in the bottling and and so it's just it's truly a lens of history and how our our country has moved or progressed or not in racial relationships. Mm -hmm. So you kind of see that gradual movement of of just working on fences to actually being a part of the distillery process. Yeah, I think, not I think, I know there has to be a more highlight of what African-Americans have done in the bourbon industry. But I do think Buffalo Trace and other companies are working hard or working at some rate to make sure that these stories are being told. And I think there's also a difficulty in finding it as yeah. well because, I mean, just talk about what it is that the distillers just not keep records. Like, yeah, how, it's document. You know, history is documented thing. You know, history. So one of the things about one of the great things about being an African American historian who studies African American history is that I get to sit down with people and have oral histories, because oftentimes when we talk about African American history, a Native American, Indigenous women's history, even sometimes they weren't documented, because when you're like considered a periphery of the society. It's not why document your history. And so, but because of that, I get to go out and, ha and interview people whose father's father was this, and they have a newspaper clipping or they have a pay stub and I get to get, and to me, that's the heart. That's the, the fruit of getting to be a historian. You know what I mean? The archives are cool. And what top down is what we call it in history. Top down history is cool, but I get to sit on people's couch and they offer me sweet tea or good tequila. You know, I get to do that. And I think after Buffalo Trace, what Buffalo Trace did for me, maybe I didn't find out a whole lot or whatever, because also, you know, Buffalo Trace on not even Buffalo Trace, companies that want you to see what they want you to see. But what happens is that, hey, now my name's in a newspaper article. Now you saw me on TV. You heard me on a podcast. And next thing I know, you're emailing me and you're, you're reaching out to me and you're asking to tell your family story to me. And you're asking for me to come to your church and interview people. And I went to, I can't remember which one. I've been to so many distilleries. I went to a distillery for an African-American history project. And at the end, those who worked the line were coming up and wanted, they had been working the line for 30 years and wanted me to record their story. That's really cool. Yeah. So that is the part that keeps me like, okay, I love this. Can you tell us one of the stories of something that came about and you went to somebody's house and, and you sat on their couch and, and recorded and documented? Like, can you kind of re so rehash I, one of those stories, sure. like something that's very memorable? So to me, the one that's probably most memorable, but which is a well-known, is Elmer Allen. She was the first black chemist for ooh, Jim Beam. I was like, I think I had that written down somewhere. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Jim Elmer Bean. Lucille Allen. Yes, yeah. Elmer Lucille, Miss Allen. Brown, and, Brown Foreman's. Yes, Brown Foreman. There we go. And she, ooh. So I did a Black History Talk. I get off the stage and she gives me this huge hug and she like whispers in my ear and says, I'm so glad you're doing this. This has to be done. And so then the next day we have a phone conversation and then she invites me to her home. And we sit there and talk for about three hours. Oh, wow. About just what it was like to work as a chemist for Brown Foreman. And I will say, so I got to walk with her most of the day when I did the presentation. It's like the, they give her the red carpet. She's got her own room. <laughs> it's like Prince has arrived at the NCV Music Awards. And it's, and just that experience and to hear her stories that I hope that I get to record and tell one day, that was kind of cool. But I've also had. So she said that, that Brown Foreman was like rolling out the red carpet for her? Oh, no, no, no. Bra I'm saying Brown Foreman rolled out the red carpet for her. Oh, you mean like when this. Oh, all, yeah. now. Yeah. Now, like if she pulls up, they are outside at her car making sure that she gets in. She has her own spot. She's amazing. Do you mind sharing some of the stories about what she had said when she actually worked so, there? And it was hard. Yeah. She said it was hard. It was hard in the sense that no one, they thought that she was a, a secretary initially and not a chemist. Mm -hmm. And she began as actually an assistant chemist and then worked her way up to the actual chemist. And just through that experience, I met like uh, other chemists, young black chemists, like 30s, late 20s, who are now black women chemists at Brown Foreman. And I got to record their names and address. Of course, the pandemic hit and then I haven't been able to like really sit down and talk. And just those experiences have been extremely important and like the best part of the journey.
And so when you sit down and talk, I'm just envisioning like a, a situ- situation where you pull out the tape recorder, you put it on the table, you <laughs> click the record button, you're like, all right, spill the beans. So some people will not allow me to record them, which is cool, but I'm old school. I have a notebook that I have recorded every single interview and I shorthand. And I know that sounds like I'm a 90 year old woman, but I'm 37. <laughs> So some people will not allow me to use my iPhone to record, which is fine. Yeah. And and so when you are taking those stories, I mean, I don't want to like rehash anything, but I I want people to understand the gravity of some things. Like, is there something that that you remember that really stood out? You're like, man, this is this is terrible. I do. And that like just to I remember one person telling me a story about working at the distillery and his father worked at the distillery. And at the time that distillery is almost in going towards Western Kentucky. And he said that if there were ever layoffs or if there were ever anything where the distillery had to cut, they would ride by the house in a pickup truck and say, hey, boy, you're, you're right now. We don't need you. We'll, we'll, we'll get you back when the season gets started. And he said that every year his father would have this angst, like, am I going to be able to go back to this particular distillery and work? Mm-hmm. Every season or whatever. And that was the, you know, that was the sense. But he, he said that uh, his, or his father told him that you wanted to work at the distillery. He said it was good money. It was good cash. But there was a season too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess you can understand the, the seasonal aspect to it yeah. sometimes and like that too. That was post-World War One, So not quite into World War II, but post-World War One Kentucky. So when you're talking to a lot of these individuals, how far back have you gone in some of these, like, you know, that's one of the issues with oral history. You know, everybody's got a family, got an uncle, got a aunt. <laughs> but, you know, they, and, and it's I, just stories that kind of get passed love, down. Yeah, yeah, I love stories and I love talking. I'm a historian. I talk for fun, but I do have to be able to document it. You know what I mean? So when you tell me your story, after you tell me your story, I've got to figure out a way to make your story. Not that I don't, because your story is your truth. It's definitely capital T truth for you, your family, your history, and your legacy. Now I have to find a way to make this truth for everyone else to see, to just find a source that just says it. You know what I mean? I think one of the good things about Uncle Nearest is that we were able to find that. You know what I mean? So that means that we have to be able to find a bill of sale. We have to be able to find pictures or some picture. kind of document. I doubt, like, but we have we have to be able to find letters. You know, I've got I've had the opportunity to read a couple of letters about I'll lease out to you my Negro boy who knows how to uh, he can distill. But I got to be able to put names and documents and those things and with that and that's the mystery part of history. So when you find documents like that, I haven't found a lot. I've only found yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, you, you found some, and I think that that goes to show the story of Uncle Nearest too. For anybody that doesn't know, you know, Uncle Nearest is the one that taught Jack Daniels, Daniels. like the Jack Daniels, how to distill. I'm assuming you you read a lot of the history about that. Can, I did. Can you kind of give our listeners a little bit of more background than? My simple one liner right <laughs> no, there. I was actually, I was, Jack didn't know. I mean, Jack Dean, our uncle nearest uh, in Tennessee, was the distiller, or what is believed, or no, he is, he taught Jack Daniels how to make whiskey, make bourbon. And we know that, and then it, it went on into the family. We know that just, was it 2000? You might have to verify that. 2008 is just when Jack Daniels, 2009 is when Jack Daniels like came out with a story publicly. What I think when I think about the Jack Daniels story and I think about Fawn Weaver, which is so cool, is that when we see that story, we know it lets us know that there's opportunity for other stories like that. There's got to be. There could not have been just one uncle nearest. That is my true whole heart belief. And that's what I'm trying to uncover. Mm -hmm. You could probably give more of an uncle nearest story better than I could. No, 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 no. I mean, that's that's believe me. I think we we owed have Fawn on the show one day to tell that story as well. I'm sure she. She can probably tell the story better than anybody. Than anybody. Yeah. She should. She definitely <laughs> should. And it's it's amazing to see her tell the story and, you know, and to make sure that Uncle Nearest and his family is given the credit for the, the contribution to the bourbon industry. And we think about when it comes to, I went to a historical lecture and we, they were talking about, when we talk about wheat and we talk about corn and we talk about all these things, Africans, enslaved Africans had bought those skills with them over from Africa. So of course they had some type of role in the bourbon industry. We talk about barely. Ex- explain that a little bit more. Like how, like how do they bring those skills over? Because I guess that's something that I'm not aware of. So when we talk about the skill of being able to produce or agriculture, 
agriculture. Because when we talk about bourbon, okay, cool. We're talking about spirits, but essentially we're talking about agriculture, right? It's a lot of leftover corn. <laughs> right. We're talking about ag. That's why I got to put in plugs for my, my institution that I work for. They have an ag program, a huge ag program, and they actually have a bourbon certificate program with corn and wheat. Kentucky State University. There you go. Go ahead and get yourself, en- <laughs> yourself enrolled right now. Right. Next semester. So, yeah. And so anyways, they talk about how that Africans, enslaved Africans, had perfected the growing of wheat and corn in Africa. And then they get to these places like Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, Maryland, and they perfect and they figure out how to grow these things. And of course, we can't say that it was for the bourbon industry, but what we know that it was for the agriculture industry. And of course, the agriculture industry transitions into bourbon. When we think about the billion dollar industry of bourbon, or we think about the economic impact enslaved African-Americans had on this country, we know that there has to be some impact that African-Americans had on bourbon, Mm -hmm. or not even just bourbon, the spirits industry. You know what I mean? I met with a local historian. I have to give him all his, Gary Gardner, I believe. He's in Hodgenville, Kentucky. He was telling me that the first distiller, he believed, he found some records where it showed that the enslaved African who was rented out to another plantation and behind him, beside his name, it said that he was a distiller, distillation. So we're like, hold on. And it came to find, well, maybe he was just working out there. But then Gardner, great historian, comes to find out that this enslaved African's owner was paid more for his work. Yeah, I think you had written somewhere that was like $114 a yes. day or something like that. 104 he was paid, which is almost twice as much as what a normal rented out enslaved African would have been paid. So it's like, oh, and he's doing this on a bourbon area. So we're like, oh no, like he's got to be doing it for $114 in 1860. He knows something. He's doing something that slaveholder wants. Those are the type of things that we have to find. And now it's going to bother me that I cannot think of what. <laughs> if they all began, like, and you, know, you know, I'm not a bourbon drinker. They all began to, like, oh, Old Forester, Four Roses. They all began to run together. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I think you had also mentioned that, you know, $114 a day. Like, that's that's a good sum of money it is. way back then. Like, it is. That's, but, of course, that we know the enslaved African didn't get it. His owner got it. Right. Right. But he was he was skilled. Mm-hmm. He was skilled. Skill labor. Yeah. Which is a lot different than, I guess, when people are saying just, you know, looking for labor labor. Right. Yeah. And, and then what we find out in that story is that he eventually is free. We don't know if he ran to freedom or free emancipation proc- or at the end of the Civil War, and he changes his name. So we don't know if he remained in the industry or what he did with the industry. I actually drove to Hodgenville and the historian, uh, Mr. Gardner, he took me on the land, what was thought to be the first place of this distillation company. We went, where else did we go? We went on the land, the farm, we went to the cemetery where it was believed that enslaved Africans were buried. And it, it, it was like a really cool experience. And I wouldn't have had that experience unless Buffalo Trace had like put my article out. Once that article went out in the Courier, it was, hey, can you come talk to me? Can you come interview people? Can you come? And I'm like, yeah, cool. Yeah. And just kind of like start recording those stories. I started recording those stories. And before I cut you off there a minute ago, you also said that enslaved Americans knew how to do stuff with barrel making or, or yeah, with cooperage. It's carpentry. It's wood. It's woodwork. And so when we talk about West Africa and we talk about Ghana and we talk about Senegal, there is this gift. And I'm not saying like there wasn't woodworking in the U.S. Of course there were. But there is this gift. And so we think about enslaved Africans coming over and working in the industry, I'm sure, I'm positive, history shows that they contributed that way in barreling. You drive through most of central Kentucky and you see the rock fence. Those are African patterns. And that's, you know, that's the contribution that African-Americans have to this industry and have or have to the country, mm-hmm. whether we're talking about ag, economics, education. Right. So I just think it's a group of citizens that we have to be very careful that we don't like just put in like a little byline in history. Right. And I think that's what a lot of people are trying to do and uh, trying to expose on all of that because I think Brown Form was one of the first ones to really embrace it and say, yes, this is it. This is the history. This is this is out there. There's other ones like Elijah Craig owned a lot of slaves. George Washington owned slaves for, for his distillery. Did you ever do any research on, on that to kind of figure out more? Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. 
From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. George Washington owned slaves for for his distillery. Did you ever do any research on on that to kind of figure out more? Yeah, of course. Uh, You know, I've read the books and, you know, I'm new. I'm not new to history. I'm a trained historian, but I'm new to the bourbon thing. So when it's time for me to go to bed at night and I put my children to bed, the one thing I read, read, I'm reading about what other people are saying about bourbon because I'm, I'm trying to catch up in the research. You know, I'm always very clear about that, that I'm I'm learning what a devil's cut is. And I'm learning, like, you know, I'm learning the field. It's fun. It's fun as hell, but I'm learning the field. Castle and Key, I've been working with them over the last six months. Uh, they're working on an African-American contribution project. And just being able to be involved in foundational things like that. And it's like really been just a cool opportunity. The Castle and Key thing, that's that's pretty interesting. Are they Are they looking at what was happening on their property with like Colonel E.H. Taylor? Or is it just trying to like bring in a bunch of history and kind of just show this was throughout the state? Without giving away their industry secret, they're just making sure that people and the their drinkers and their customers are aware of that bourbon, the bourbon industry wouldn't stand where it stands without African-American contribution. Right. So they're highlighting maybe not necessarily their specific castle and key, but just an overall thought and just a commemoration of the African-American contribution to the bourbon industry. Mm -hmm. When you are talking to people and trying to record and and document those stories and you're trying to look for physical evidence sometimes, Mm -hmm. I I think that's the tough part, right? That is is the hard part. Because... And I'm a man of one. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Or a team of one. Yeah, a team of one on a mission to, (laughs) to just try to find some more information. When you find a picture or you find a document What's that what's that feeling like and can you kind of oh, man. kind of like put a concrete example of of like something that you you did find or you're able to kind of connect those dots together? So I will say that finding a picture I have not experienced. When if I find a picture you're going to hear me all the way from Lexington. It's probably in the archives. <laughs> Usually I guess it would be in some archives of discovery yeah. when you so, see So but these. most of the archives that we've seen or most of the pictures that we've seen have been released. But for me, I want to be in somebody's attic one day and find a picture. Mm -hmm. That would be the coolest for me. I think hearing the stories is the coolest for me. Reading the articles, uh, like I said, Buffalo Trace has given me the most access. And reading their articles and seeing the newspapers, they had a, a little newspaper that would go out monthly to their employees. And you see it transition after World War II, where you see where, okay, Black people aren't on the cover. Then after World War II, Black people are on the cover. And then we talk- we, and this is at Buffalo, or at, well, at what was, what, George T. Stagg or yeah, o- 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 OFC back yeah, then and whatever yeah. it was, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you see this transition. And then I also get to see exposure of like their wine branch in there. It's, it's just really, that was really cool. And just seeing where men, of course, you know, we can still talk about in the bourbon industry where most African-Americans still only work on the line, or not only, I don't like, they work on the line 
or they're in human resources. Mm -hmm. And so there still needs, we need African-Americans in leadership positions in the bourbon industry, right? You know, we, we can be CEOs, we do director of marketing, we can be director of marketing. And so that, just seeing that transition and having those conversations has been really, really cool to me. Yeah. And I hate to keep bringing up the the archive thing, because I think it's really cool Mm -hmm. being able to, to kind of go and having a distillery keep all this sort of stuff and for you to kind of piece together a story. So when you look at it and you you look at the archives, kind of talk us through like what do you what are you doing with this work? Is okay. it just for your personal study? Is it oh, no. for turning it into a, a larger a larger piece? When you find these, like just take Buffalo Trace as an example, you know, you find all these pictures and you find everything, like what's the process? What what do you what's the end goal with it? So the process, like in real life, I put on my little white gloves, I put on my AirPod if I can find them. <laughs> just the just the right one. Just, yeah, the right one. <laughs> um and I like listen to music because it's super cold and it's super quiet. Of course, you know, these are their any company or any industry, these are their documents. This is their history. So they want you to be very careful with them. And I sit there for hours. <laughs> I can't take any bags in or any books because, you know, obviously they, they want to preserve their items. And I literally go through page by page by page. And I am in the, I want to read everything because you and I, you could be in an archive and you see something different than I see. I want to see, you know, what was said and what was communicated. And that is, that's my job. And, you know, what I always tell people, though, like, oh, well, why are you still only doing this one? Why haven't you moved on to this? And why are you going to the Fraser Museum? I'm like, I am a... There's a lot of unsolved mysteries. There are a lot of unsolved mysteries. And I am, like, really trying. And I, you know, I pull out my MacBook and I see what I can do. But, like, I am literally a team of one. And the end goal... And I'm a full-time professor. And of course, this doesn't, you know, I do this literally for fun, for for the passion, for the history of it. I'm not paid to do bourbon or do bourbon on the side. Of course, I'm in academia. So the goal one day is to write this book that uncovers all of the Black bourbon industry. And then they're going to give me like $500 million and then I'm going to do a world tour. (laughs) Well, just remember you were on here first. (laughs) So of course, that's the insane goal you know, is the book or the project or it's a Good Morning America here with Aaron Gitlam, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, but like, I do have to remind people, like, I literally do this. I don't want to call it a hobby because I, I do have a PhD in history, but I literally do this for fun. Yeah. So kind of talk about when you're reading a, you know, whether it's a letter or whether it's a manuscript or whether it's a bill of sale, give us an example of like what you read that, that uncovers something of, of African-American history, like at a distillery. I think one of the biggest was reading Gary Gardner's things in Hodgenville and reading that and seeing the bill of sale and then seeing the letter where he wrote back to his former owner and he changes his name, seeing that and like knowing that that story is here, needs to be finalized. We need. But, how, do you, how do you put that, like, how do you timeline that into a story? And, oh, like, history. It, history, t- like you got to figure out. Did he write? If he rode the train, so he rode the train. You know that it had to exist between 16, 1863 and 1878. So now I got to put that together. If he worked at a certain place, then where did blacks live who worked at certain places? And if he owned a horse and listed as property, did he have children? So now I need to go to the deeds and see if there are any children listed as property. So like that becomes part of the story. I spent a lot of time at county records. <laughs> census. I will say the pandemic has shown me a lot of things have been digitized, but it's digitized the way that it's completely written. So I still have to print it and put on bifocals to figure it Get out. Get your highlighter out. <laughs> Get, yes. And so those county record offices, that those are my saving grace. My local historians who know a story or a whispering story that I need to figure out. And now I just got to figure out how to document it. Is there a certain individual that you can like, come up with by name? When you're sitting here looking through all your research, it says like, that's, that's a really interesting story that you're able to like uncover through just listening to, like looking through archives. Like, is there a certain name that, that came to so mind? So I'll be honest, I know you're like, you're asking for a name, name, name. So well, not industry, a name. I'm just, I'm just thinking of like, of just a, you know, like a good, like an example to kind of tell our listeners, like, this is, this is a, a true story of something that happened. I think the best story would be, and see, that's why I want to like give names because, you know, you start giving names and people are like, oh, 
Aaron said this guy was a distill. And, you know, I haven't completely confirmed the story. Right, right. Yet. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll say Mr. A then. Yeah, right. like, yeah. so Mr. A, yeah. And, you know, I figure out that he, his lease is time and that he gets to actually leave. He actually gets to live with his family, still on the plantation, but he gets to live with his family off to the side. He doesn't live in the slave quarters with other enslaved Africans. And I find out that he's one of the most trusted when it comes to the crop. You know, he's one of the most trusted. And then later when he leaves in freedom, he goes to work for another distiller. You know, that's the story that I've heard between churches and, and all that. And I found the need to sell, but I need to figure out, is this true when it comes to, did he really work with this bourbon company? Mm-hmm. And I'm believing that Mr. A is, but I also want to make sure the the one thing about being a trained historian is that I never want to put like anything out there that I can't like document. Or back up. Or, or back anything. up. And the yeah. next thing you know, you're like, oh, she's a fake. She's a fraud. <laughs> she, she, that she's, PhD is shit. Right. <laughs> she's a fraud. <laughs> No, I, I don't think anyone's going to say that about you. At least, at least, God, I hope not. <laughs> they say so much. I'm like, I'm just, so I'm always really careful. And then I'm always really careful about uh, families. Rightfully so. Families want to be the first to tell their family story. If you figure out something about their family, they want to be the first to tell their story. They want to be the first to come out with a newspaper article. They also want to call, they call and say, hey, 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 have you figured this out? Have you found this? Have you found this? Have you looked? I'm like, I haven't found it yet. But they want to make sure that, I mean, no one's made me sign, well, no family has ever made me sign a confidentiality agreement. But they've always been very clear. Hey, we want to be able to tell the story. Mm-hmm. But uh, companies, they want you to sign confidentiality I, 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 Within good reason, I guess, sometimes. And I would imagine that, you know, when we talk about notable figures, we talk about Elijah Craig, we talked about George Washington. Like, it's it's documented that, you know, they owned slaves and, and they were a part of the right. process. Mm-hmm. They were a part of the process. I know that just from my reading, but is there any more to that story that that you know that you could share about any of the other individuals that, again, were are notable names in, in bourbon history, but maybe there's just an anecdote that people don't know about? I think that that's a good question. And I now I feel like you're the teacher and I'm unprepared because... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> no, of course I know the story, like, but I haven't. Like I said, I, all I know is like the, the few sentences that I've read, but beyond that, it's like, uh, you, there's, it's hard to find any more information. It is. It's, and it's hard for me other outside of what people have published. And I'll be honest, I have not been trying to focus on that narrative. What is your focus then? I guess it's, it's the African-American contribution. It's yeah. really the role that blacks played in this. And we talk about bourbon. It's a billion dollar industry. Right. And so we're saying that the f- it's not even a word, but keep in mind, I have a four and a nine year old. The freest source of labor didn't have any contribution would be preposterous. You know what I mean? It's that better than like free or right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm like, the free, and I the freer, <laughs> the freer version. I, I should know this. My grandmother teaches English or taught English. So I should. But I'm just like, you know, so we know. But I get into that. And then when I uh, bur- black bourbon guilds asked me to speak and I'm and they're like, we got to get black people, black kids, black scientists, ba- black agriculture's back in bourbon. We have to. So that's been a big push for me, too. Do you feel like that's a lot to put on your shoulders sometimes? No, no. If I had a grant or some money, no, I do it all. I drive up and down Kentucky all day long and do it. It can be. And, you know, I think the most frustrating part is sometimes having to tell people like, hey, I haven't had a chance. Like, you know, I'm lit- this is literally my hobby. Um, and so I just hadn't had a chance, but I haven't forgotten your family's story. And I'm going to get your story. I'm going to get your family's story out. And, you know, especially, and it's so sad almost, during Black History Month, that's when like I'm booked Thursday through Saturday, but then I'm dead March, April, May. Well, not July. I'm here. Not July. I'm here, right? And so I get this excitement, and people want to tell me their story, and then it's like, okay, now I need that. I need I need the companies to have that same excitement they had during Black History Month, that same excitement that they had during diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like now, I need you to. You've done that. You've paid me to come out and speak. Now help help me with the research. Allow me access to your archives with that, without being, you only could see this. You could only can see that. No pictures. Allow me real, authentic, historical access to your archives. Right. I mean, that's, it shouldn't be something that I understand from a company standpoint. They are like, oh, we got to protect ourselves from a PR standpoint. But you look at what Brown Foreman did. You know, if you, if you own it and you say this is, this is part of what it was, this is part of our history and we have to, we have to understand it to be able to kind of embrace it and, and move on and, and, and empower others. We're in like a really 
think about the racial climate that we're in right now. And so, you know, everybody wants to make sure that they're being, I don't want to necessarily say politically correct, but they're being sensitive. And so when you have those type of stories and you have those type of things, not everybody's as, as open, you know what I mean, to hearing the story or wanting the story to be on the front page. I commend Brown Foreman. I commend any company that brings me in. And I'm always, if you ask me to speak, I'm going to speak, I'm going to come. But, you know, I speak other days in Black History Month. Right. So, <laughs> and I know that sounds kind of mean. No, but, no, it like, doesn't. I speak other, you know what I mean? And and it's just like, okay, like, I'll do this. And you're going to pay me to come speak. And you're going to give me your finest bourbon. And you're, you find out I drink tequila. Usually everybody gives me tequila. <laughs> um <laughs> But then you, now the next month, ask me how you can support me. And that, that's, not, that's not necessarily financial either. You know what I mean? Right. That's, like I said, access to your archives. Your intern who most, or the places I've been, most of them have historical or history interns. Let me borrow them for a couple of hours. So that's the kind. That's the kind of thing. You go drill them in a in a dark room with no, a spotlight. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding with you. Like, where's some? I just need some copies, or well, probably not copies. All right, let me have that. But just something, or you know, someone knows the archives. But right. where can I find this box? So that's that's the that's the part that I yearn for. I would love more of. All right. All right. So last kind of question, fun question. We'll kind of talk about tequila a little bit. We right, actually cool. we actually poured some tequila um, when we good. started this. Have you ever uncovered anything with African American history in tequila? I have not, but the tequila, look, this is gonna sound. The tequila industry has not paid me. No, <laughs> the tequila industry. I have not been sought out, and I literally drink tequila for fun. <laughs> I am. It's so funny because I'm like the bourbon girl now. But if anybody, if I say, "Hey, come over to my house," we're all getting together, a bunch of my friends. You're gonna bring me a bottle of tequila. Yeah. It's, and and you're a sipping tequila. It's not like a margarita. Kind no, 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 of thing. no, no, no. Yeah, no. you 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 like the real thing. I like tequila. Yeah, yeah. But I have because you know, shoot, bourbon companies bring me out. So I have been opening my palate to bourbon. But now, if you start asking me how many years it's aged, and I'm like, eh. we'll figure that out later. <laughs> I'll get it. But you know, I've had I've had the opportunity to drink Pappy. Like how many? I've got to drink Pappy. Yep. Yeah, and so you're I mean, making people jealous already. <laughs> and you know that's cool. It, like. Like, that's a cool-ass job, like, to be able to go to different distilleries and they take you into a bar that's not on the floor, that's this full-packed bar of everything they've tried, made, and you get uh, and you get to see that. Oh, my God. So, uh, James T. Pepper. Mm-hmm. Look, I'm having a good memory right now. James T. Pepper took me on a private tour. It was the prettiest, I don't even know if that's a word in the bourbon industry, the prettiest distillery I've ever seen in my life, from the barrels to the smell to the floors to the windows. That appreciation for just the experience, I was in love. Was in love. Like, and I'm not even, you know, you know, I don't drink bourbon. But now I'm like, oh, well, somebody asked me, well, what's a bourbon? I'm like, well, James C. Pepper. And I don't even know. <laughs> just, I just had, it had a, left a good impression I, on you. They left a, a, an amazing impression on me. It right. was just a really cool one-on-one. I got to walk around with the master distiller. I got to walk around with just, just the, it was just like a really laid back, relaxed situation. You know what I mean? I've also been, what's the one right off in Lexington? It's all tech. They've got Town Branch. And Town a, Branch. Okay, I went yeah. to Town Branch. Exactly. So I went to Town Branch. I went in the winter and they were making me warm coffee drinks with bourbon. And it was just like, and then ciders with bourbon. And they're like, okay. And then it's so cool because everybody, they obviously pay attention. Well, we know you don't drink bourbon, but try this. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I get to have those cool experiences. Well, I guess the other good thing about it is when you talk to these massive bourbon companies, they have a big portfolio. And they, they do. They have tequila in there most most times. They do. Not. They yeah. do. Brown Foreman gave me some really good tequila. They gave me a huge, nice thing of tequila. But it's like, you know, so I appreciate that. I appreciate the hospitality of that. I just... Give me the same hospitality to go through your archives. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Show me the books. Yeah, Show let me, me book. see. Let me see. Well, Aaron, I say thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your story no and problem. sharing a little bit of your findings as well. I mean, I think it's just something that is really noteworthy and cool of, of what you're doing because this isn't something that you're quote unquote getting paid for and right, doing it right. year round. I mean, this is this is a this is a passion project. It is. And, it and is. It's just and as somebody that's you know like yourself, you're in, in academia. It's continue education, continue learning, and just kind of discovering more and sharing that with the world. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate it. And it's literally, um, anybody who's listening to this and wants to tell me their family story, I'd love, I would love to hear it. That's what I'm in it for. You know, bourbon's just the conduit, but I really just want to hear. I want to get the African-American story, the Black story out there, and I just want to hear family stories. 
For sure. So if people do want to get in contact they, with you, yes. how do they do it and how do they follow you on social media and they can learn about your, your AirPod troubles too? <laughs> oh gosh. Well, the best way to get in contact with me is email, which is Aaron, E-R-I-N, Gilliam, G-I-L-L-I-A-M-P-H-D at gmail.com. I'm pretty easy to find on social media, Dr. Aaron Gill for Twitter and Instagram. But please don't tell my mom what I say. <laughs> because I have not. <laughs> please don't tell my mom or my pastor what I say. So just go with it. But anybody can follow me. I'm cool. Right on. So make sure you follow her. Follow Bourbon Pursuit wherever you get your socials as well. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and even TikTok. And if you like what you hear, make sure you leave us a review. Share it with a friend, like sharing bourbon or tequila with a friend as well. But with that, cheers, everybody. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you.